So let me introduce our next speaker. Um, he's Art Murray. He's the founder and CEO of Applied Knowledge Sciences, and his basic passion is drawing knowledge out of experts. You know, he, he can get monks to break years of silence and, and pour out their, their deepest thoughts. Uh, so anyway, um, Art is going to talk about uh, taming the digital hairball. So we'll see how we can apply the tools and techniques that you see in the, in the exhibit hall. There's a lot of good data. You can see data analytics um, being presented there. You can see text analytics. And then there's knowledge graphs. Um, so all of those things are really coming to, to the front, forefront of KM in the past several years. Um, so I'm going to talk, so he, he's going to talk to you about um, a short study that he did um, trying out these different tools and seeing different ways to apply them. So he's going to share that with you. So I now present to you Art Murray. Yeah, thank you. All right. I'm your session chair as, or your track chair as well as your first speaker after lunch. So I'm trying to wear those two hats the right way. Okay, taming the digital hairball um, knowledge base is growing exponentially. How do we, how can we manage that? How can we get a handle on that? So we'll run through uh, some quick topics here. Um, what's, what are the drivers? What's, what is pushing uh, us to, you know, face these challenges um, and even the technology drivers that we can maybe ma made up to help address those other challenges? Um, meeting the challenges head on. And then what we learned, I guess so we, we did a little test study trying to apply these tools and techniques to this burgeoning uh, flood of knowledge and, and information. And then uh, we'll share with you what we learned and keeping pace with technology as it races on. So first of all, with regard to what's driving this, you know, you, that exhibit hall is, is full of, you know, vendors who are helping you manage your, this flood of knowledge. Anybody familiar with the five V's? Raise your hand if you know what the five V's are. The five V's of information. Okay, these are information drivers. Uh, volume, of course, you know, volume is exploding. And right along with volume, velocity. So the, the amount of information we're bombarded with is coming at us at an ever faster, ex ever accelerating rate, right? Obviously, it's overwhelming us across a wide variety of topics, disciplines, right, and perspectives even. So that's hitting us. The other two Vs are veracity. You're, from, you're hearing a lot now about deep fake AI, right? Questionable veracity, misinformation, disinformation. Is it real? Is it fake? So questionable veracity, how do you weed out the truth out of everything that, that we're being bombarded with? And then finally, value, right? Uh, you know, and I think you, if, if you are in K, if you are KMers, <coughs> KMers working in your organization, you probably realize very quickly that about 90% of what you're managing is junk, <laughs> right? Um, so how do you ferret out the real value of all that flowing around there? So those, that's what's driving us. So how do we meet that challenge? Um, I'm saying that there are two sides. Um, anybody familiar with what Tim Berners-Lee talks about when he says the two-sided semantic web? Okay, so that's something you might want to explore a little bit. Tim Berners-Lee had this two-sided semantic web. The semantic web, first of all, started out with having machine-readable ontologies so that machines can understand the, what's in the content that's being passed around. But he realized quickly, no, there's still a human component, right? And so humans possess these characteristics, right? Uh, humans can have insight, right, intuition. Whereas machines are purely computation, computational, right? They can't evoke questions, right? Humans, I mean, machines will ask questions that you program into them, but they're not going to generate questions on their own, right? So this is clearly you know, a distinction, and it's something that's, that's not going to change, right? And as we fl get flooded with information, you'll see the role humans are still going to have to play. So humans can teach machines. We develop the, we have the insights so we can, as best we can through AI, put those heuristics, rules of thumb, um, and other formulas that we come up with, we can put, automate those in machines, and then machines can return back, they can t tell us, you know, patterns that are being identified, right? So machines can teach humans, and humans can teach machines, and there's that cycle, and if we have a system of knowledge governance underneath, 
to keep that kind of managed, then we've got a situation where the machines are over there working the, the volume, vol velocity, and, and variety piece, and the humans are working the veracity and value piece. And what we find is that, and anybody familiar with Bridgewater, um, Ray Dalio, he's uh, heads the, he's sort of emeritus chairman now of you know, one of the top hedge funds. He was successful because he found this formula. He said, the machines teach me and I teach the machines. And when he got that going, uh, he found out they, they were more powerful together. So I'm going to show you an example at the end where this is, where this is true. Yes, yeah, by, and by the way, feel free to ask questions. In, uh, that's good. Do you see veracity moving over to the, to the machine side? As we talk about deep fakes, they're saying now that some of, the, some of the results are so convincing that it really takes a machine to understand the history or the data behind the images or to determine whether or not it's original or modified. Sure, and that's where the loop comes in. The human, you know, right now the machines don't, may not have the capacity to identify, what, but uh, I, I'll give you an example, like Frank Abagnale, Catch Me If You Can, or you know, any of the other con artists, right? Um, what happens uh, as part of their prison sentence? They, their community service is to help the people they defrauded detect you know, other people you know, do, pulling the same tricks that they did. So to answer your question, is it tends to start at the human side. Uh, to tell the machines what to look for, but then again, you can just, you know, through machine learning, pattern and anomaly detection may reveal that, ah, there's a little, something a little bit funny about this uh, message, this video. Uh, so it does, um, I think to answer your question, it goes both ways, and that's, I, that's probably an important point here. It's a cycle. Always uh, humans, machines, humans, machines working together. Okay, good question. So. On the search side, we have the legacy, what we call the bucket approach, right? Um, we're collecting all this content in your organization. You're saying, please be a good sport about it and tag everything, <laughs> right? Um, and then, you know, so that kind of helps uh, you ferret things out. But still, um, you're getting, if you're using the search approach, the search uh, bar approach, you're going to get a big long list of documents, and you have to scroll through those documents, okay? Um, so that's the search side. We're mostly search oriented, but very little navigation. And so what I'm leading into here when, we, when we're going to start to introduce knowledge graphs, and you see the benefit of those knowledge graphs that are in the exhibit hall, they allow you to better navigate. And that's that digital hairball we're talking about. Um, so everybody have a good idea of what uh, the difference between search and navigation. Is that a clear distinction for everybody, right? OK. Um, so on the, there's another thing with regard to information retrieval, and that's precision versus recall. So if our tools give us exactly, every document that is returned by that search tool is an exact perfect match of what we're looking for, that's very high precision. But to get 100% perfect precision, you tend to sacrifice recall. So you may get some documents that are exactly what you're looking for, but there may be a bunch more that you're not getting returned, right? That's the recall side of that curve. And the more you try and say, well, I want to make sure that I get every document that has about this topic or this subject or answers this question, if you make, try to force recall to a value of one, then you're going to get a whole lot of junk again, right? It's that 90% junk is going to come along with all those accurate documents. So this is the trade-off. This is this. What we're, and what we're trying to do with these technologies is bend that curve slightly so we can have both precision and recall. We can have the best of both worlds. That's what we're aiming for. Okay, so far so good? Okay, so the secret sauce to doing this is... Graph theory. So, you know, all of the, the knowledge graphs you see in the exhibit hall are based on graph theory in mathematics, and they're built upon graph databases, okay? And they're good because everything's broken down into something like ARB, right? Semantic triples. If you're familiar with RDF, this morning's presentation talked about RDF, uh, JPL, as when they were talking about how they built their knowledge graph, they, they pivoted it right on RDF. And it's everything, an object has a relationship with another object, A related to B, A related to B. So that's good. And then that allows you to, to build a better database than the relational model or the content management data or the content database model, 
Okay? So I'm going to show you how that works. But anyway, that's the secret sauce. And so by using, by extracting from our document collection and even our discourse, all, anything, any narrative or anything, anything that we can capture in text and, and in data, if we begin to ferret out what is being talked about and how it's all related and how those dots are connected, that's our knowledge graph. And then that's the thing that we navigate. And that's where we gain new insights that we might not have discovered if we were just plowing through documents on our own. Okay? So let me show you how that, how that works. It's, uh, again, the, t the tool text analytics forum is going on here. They're, a lot of their work deals with entity relation extraction, okay? Entity association extraction. So everything's into categories. So they're persons, organizations, uh, places, things, um, you know, um, all the different categories. These may be the equivalent of classes in software, right? And there are dozens of those special classes of objects, classes of things, classes of, of things that make up our world. And then entities are the specific instances of those classes, right? So entities are individual persons, individual places, individual things, products, services, etc. And there are thousands of those. And that's where we get our, we, our digital hairball starts to grow. Because there are thousands and thousands of those entities, but they all belong to just dozens of classes. So it makes it a little bit manageable. If we know what the classes are, uh, the entities don't seem to be quite so overwhelming. And then different types of associations. There are typically hundreds of ways that those entities can be associated with each other. Right? It can be physical proximity. It can be interdependencies, right? And uh, we'll, again, show you some of those. So those are the three things, categories, uh, entities, and then associations. And that's what text analytics tools generating these knowledge graphs try to extract. Okay, so we came up with, uh, we, we started to play around with some of these tools. We had two vendors uh, give us, give us a, a, allow us to share or, you know, lo loaned us their, their, their tools. Um, and they were uh, Rosoka and, and Megaputer. But so here we have this pile of documents, all this, and it could be anything. It could be emails, uh, text messages, and, but reports. Trip reports, you know, you name it. All the, all the documents flowing around your organization. We crunch those. We let the machines crunch away at those and organize those. And those were our two tools I mentioned that we used in this study. And what came out? Here's the thing. If and, and keep this in mind, even for for the vendors in there. Um, if you're, it's great that these tools exist and they can now present you a map of everything that's being talked about in this pile of documents. But guess what? Are you willing to trust what the machine tells you? The missing piece, and this is a very important piece, is sense making. There has to be that human evaluation of the output. And this is where your subject matter experts, or even just somebody who's very intuitive, somebody should be watched, somebody should be providing adult supervision to this extraction, this, auto, this process automation. By the way, a lot of this ties into if you're doing a robotic process automation and autom looking at automating many of your processes, this is it. You can, you can use machine learning algorithms to begin to, 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 to convert those activities into AI, but there should be adult supervision saying, is that? And then if it does make sense, great. If it doesn't make sense, you know, feedback into the, into the algorithms. All right, so let's, let's show you the steps involved in that. We took our document collection, ingested it, and we used our text extraction association engines. And those have ontologies. Out-of-the-box ontologies are pretty good in some of these tools. So that's, what's, that's what it's working against. Everybody understand what ontology is? In other words, it's like a taxonomy, only instead of a hierarchy, everything's interconnected, right? It defines how everything. It's, it's that RDF on steroids, right? A related to B. All the dots and how all the dots are connected is defined in that ontology. And that's how you were able to generate, uh, ultimately, a knowledge map. Okay, and there it is. There's our little digital hairball on the right. But again, put the human in, in the loop and likewise enter updates. So you've got uh, every tool has an ontology to start with. 
but as you evaluate the output, you can then adjust that ontology so the next time it's more accurate. And, and a lot of this has to deal with semantics, right? What is the meaning of things? And that's another important role for having a good ontology is that the understanding of the meaning and intent of the documents that you're analyzing is captured properly. And you can only do that through constant refinement. So again, that human in the loop is essential, okay? Um, and then, once you've gotten that together, then you say, okay, here's what we discovered uh, from uh, this pile of documents, and we have new insights. And then we can feed that back in as a, as a could be a new best practice, a new, an, or a new standard even, okay? So far, so good. That was our first pass, the, the first attempt. Dump the documents in the machine, and then let the human see what, uh, observe what comes out, and then you know, apply it in our organization. So we, uh, basically, the two most useful outputs that came out of that first pass were automated taxonomy generation and that, that our digital hairball, as you can see here. This, you know, in other words, this is, this is a representation of everything talked about in those docs. It's just a screenshot. Uh, you can hover over those as, as we do here. Um, but that's, a, that's using a graphical representation of what is in those documents. And so let's say you, know, you, can, you can hover over any one of those and, and, and find out more information about it. And, it's, and you see how things are linked to each other. But let's, let's look about how to get into that digital hairball a little bit. But first pass, we said, all right, let's, do an, let's, let's compare using these tools with the way we do things now. So the way we did things now was, was the baseline. So what improvement did we get from this first pass, where we just dumped the documents in to an, uh, an entity relation extraction tool and looked at the outputs and refined them? What was the change there? So. Uh, we found out that, you know, sometimes volume, the, the more documents you throw in there, it starts to slow the, the system down to a crawl. So that, that can be a problem. So capacity to handle real-time data, if that, you know, that first is the case, then handling real-time data is going to be a problem. And then auto extraction still needs, like I said, that, that adult supervision, um, especially for finding, uh, you know, esoteric terms, right? It may not understand something, so you're, you need to continually update that. Um, veracity was kind of, it wasn't really the, the best in terms of, of detecting what's wrong and what's not, what's not wrong. It goes back to this gentleman's point, you know, how do I, the, the machine doesn't initially able to detect what's, what's truth and what's not. You've got to have the humans to help it. Uh, and you'll see as we go on uh, how we can improve that. So here we are. We, we uh, put together a score and we, we said roughly, okay, and this is just purely no, these are subjectives. We just try to say, hey, let's just get a feel for, you know, these different measures and how we're improving. So that first pass, uh, we came up with a score of 11 out of 30. Yeah, that's purely notional. We want a relative ranking, a relative rating. So there we go for our first pass. Second pass, we thought, yeah, okay, um, we come in with the documents again, but this time, instead of dumping the documents into the machine, we let the humans go through them. Say, okay, so here's all this stuff. Uh, how would you categorize, how would you sort and organize them? This is something along the lines of what we call knowledge curation, right? How would you curate this pile of, this, this morass <laughs> of data and information? Um, so you organize it. Don't let the machine and its out-of-the-box ontology organize it. You organize it and then feed it to the machine, okay? Giving the machine a little bit of an edge, a little bit of a head start as to how these different entities are all flesh out. And likewise, then again, have that human in the loop at, at the end to see, okay, what comes out now after we add that extra element, okay? And so here's what they, those same steps look like. We had, we had our human dumped the documents in, right? We, we uh, ingested the documents, generated the knowledge graph, and then had our SME insights go back and feed back in there, right? And both the ontology and even the document collection itself, and act upon now this second wave, this second pass, should give us even better information. Well, well how, how good was it? Well, um, oh, by the way, and, and other, uh, we, we began to ratchet up the outputs First one was just a taxonomy, right, and, 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 and a knowledge graph. This one, we uh, sort of added a little bit. We did text classification, right, and sentiment analysis. The one thing, the really good thing, and you'll see how this really can, can help you, is 
the text analytics tools can measure sentiment. Now, a lot of retail companies have gotten, you know, have been doing this for years. They're monitoring the social media discourse, what people are saying about their company and their products, and then very quickly you know, adjusting accordingly. So the, there, are, there are some salience, or some uh, sentiment indicators are indicated there. Salience at the top, right? Uh, polarity. So salience is how important is does it seem to, does that topic that's being talked about, with what level of importance does that message convey, is that message conveying? Okay, and sentiment indicators can do that. Then they could also say, okay, polarity. Is there, you know, positivity or negatively, right? What, what is the, 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 along the spectrum of, of highly positive and highly negative, where does that sit? So you see it's, it can be measured from minus three to plus three. Aspect is, how believable is it, or how, how much does that you know, impact you in terms of, in terms of you're getting your attention, right? That's different from intensity. Intensity is, are you screaming? Is it, is it somebody very quietly trying to sneak something through, or is, are they really screaming for attention? That's the intensity. And then mood is, is similar, uh, is, you know, is it positive or negative in terms of the mood being expressed? in the discourse or in the, in the writing. Even this could be email discourse, text discourse, or it could be report writing. You can use this to, to see, hey, there's no emotion in what you're writing. You <laughs> can go back and, and put some emotion into it. All right? So anyway, we, we got uh, discovered insights from that. Um, so here's an example. Um, yeah, so we can get potential flags high, low, or indifferent sentiment levels, as well as semantic distance. And I'll give you an example of that where you know, there, there's something is being looked at and they have two totally different meanings. And so is there confusion between some, is, is, are two different objects being treated the same or are, you know, they, should, are they being tr treated separately as they should? What is the semantic distance, okay? So that's our, that was our second pass. We, so we, we, we wove in semantics and, and, and um, sentiment. And here's what we got for our score using the same evaluation. We were able to, because we were able to pre, you know, it's sort of like data cleaning a little bit. We did that upfront organization. That helped improve the, the process of help the machines. You know, so we did, it didn't take as long to crunch through the data. Um, likewise, the velocity, the speed at which we were able to, to, to do the analysis uh, increased. Um, there was a little bit of reduction in, in, in variety, um, improved uh, uh, veracity, okay, because again, we had that human pass through, uh, so it was a little bit clear semantically what was being talked about, and then the value for the same reason. So um, overall, um, the machine uh, eased the computational load on the humans, but the humans sort of did that pre-processing that was lacking in the machines originally. So what was our score? We bumped up, again, from 11, a score of 11 out of 30 to 17 out of 30. Again, it's purely a subjective, relative measure, but we're trying to see, are we improving? Okay, so that was our second pass, right? Third pass. Now, um, he, uh, oh, the third pass. So the, the first two passes you saw we used, um, Commercial tools, these are enterprise software tools, very powerful, and they're kind of expensive, okay? Rasoka and, and Megaputer um, are good, so if, if you can afford it, if you're, if you're an enterprise, uh, from looking at it from an enterprise level, you know, great, take advantage of those tools. Um, however, maybe sm uh, smaller companies or some companies treat money differently. They, it's strange, I've, I've been in organizations where uh, they are loath to spend any money on any additional tool, but they'll love, to, they have all this workforce that they'll have people working you know, a long time uh, at low pro rates of productivity because they, they have hours, but they don't have procurement money. Uh, or it could be the other way around. So we decided to do, okay, let's make our third pass just so we can educate ourselves a little bit. Let's use some open source stuff and at the same time get to compare what it's like using you know, some nice, sophisticated, uh, commercially available tools versus what's out there available in open source. So we use some real simple, most of this stuff is cheap or free, right? 
Um, there's the Sigma Knowledge Engineering Environment, if you're uh, familiar with that. It's an open source ontology, and Adam Pease, who uh, is the original developer of that ontology, SUMO, uh, suggested Upper Merged Ontology, S-U-M-O, uh, Adam is the, the developer of that. He sort of watches over it. It's, pr I think, the largest open source ontology available. Not, not WordNet, or those are dictionaries. This is a real, true ontology. So we used, uh, and Sigma is the Sumo tool, but again, freely available. So we used that and used a, a, a um, knowledge base, out of a WordPress plugin. Okay, we used WordPress and we used the Echo Knowledge Base plugin to, to build our knowledge base content out, okay? And then Neo4j was our graph database. And that's, you know, sort of, they're, they're pretty open about that, pretty, pretty low cost. Uh, if you begin to apply it commercially, they'll want to, to license it, but they're still very reasonable. So that's our new tool set, just to try this stuff out. So we did the same thing, right? Humans organized, we ran it through the documents, and this time we, we, we did the entity extraction. Oh, and we used Watson for our entity relation extraction, our NLP, right, processing. We used IBM Watson, and they're good. I mean, you, you can, I, they, they give you a whole bunch of space and capacity for free, and then once, if you go really high, like way up in the gigabytes, then they start metering it, okay? So but that, that's pretty good. Again, if, if you wanna do this stuff on the cheap to try it out, uh, Watson was great for the entity relationship extraction. And then likewise, we, we did the machines, but we used a, a um, Java plugin called NeoViz, okay, NeoViz.js, which somebody else, this is the neat, neat thing about open source, right? So Neo4j, open source graph database. Somebody else did the knowledge graph to render the contents uh, of the graph database, and that was called NeoViz.js, okay? So anyway, all open source stuff, same kind of thread, same kind of cycle, right? And um, going back and forth. Oh, and here's, so here's a little bit where our work with Sumo, the, the upper man, suggested upper um, ontology uh, came into play, and there are some other ontologies and uh, so, yeah, so suggested upper merged ontology. And you see there's quite a number of, of items there, right? So we were able to use that. The, the thing is, we had a, a, a session this morning on ISO 30401, right? Uh, the importance of a standard, because when everybody's talking different languages, even about KM, everybody's the, talking, I've got 100 people in the room, we're talking about 100 different ways of looking at KM. So that standard was, was, uh, was aimed at trying to get some, some standardization of the what, not the how. Uh, the upper merged ontology is kind of the same. It, it gives you a, 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 some, a reference. So when you say person, what we've learned to do is, um, person, what is it? And we'll find out that there may be different types of persons. So we go to the Sumo ontology and say, okay, what type of person are we talking about here, right? And, and we link uh, those, ent as these entities are being extracted, let's say by Watson, we are linking them to the submerged upper uh, ontology in Sumo. Does that make sense? So see what's coming out of the machine again. Now the human says, let me go over to the ontology and try and make them up. Not done by machine, the, you, a human, uh, makes that connection. Okay, so, and then here, here ontologies are layered. Uh, there's a whole, you know, we're not going to get into ontology too much, but the idea is the, the upper layers are the more general terms, right, that defines, and then as you go down to more definitive esoteric terms, you can then extend those ontologies to be more esoteric. We're going to be use, looking at one where we used in the field of project management, okay, just as an example. Music is, you know, there are ontologies for everything, but that top layer, the blue part, is where we're, a lot of people like Sumo are aimed at. Can we un at least understand in general terms what people are talking about? Okay. Um, oh, so has anybody ever used card sorting? Okay, yeah, yeah hands, hands go up here. And there, and there are automated tools for doing this. But here's a good way to build ontologies manually. Again, this is important because if you're going to be doing a better job of plowing through the mountains and stacks of documents, and especially when it comes to things like identifying veracity, right, and value, 
the richer and better your ontology is, the better you will be able to apply those tools. So one way to do this is with the card sorting technique, and that's basically getting together with the people who are going to be using in the user community or in the business or in the organization, and just on blank cards say, start writing out everything about, what, about your work and what you do and organize it, right? So I say, okay, well, I, you know, I, I, I get um, invoices in, right? So I, I process invoices, then what do you do next, okay? And you lay those out on a table, and that's a, a good way to organize uh, what is being the work that's being done. So now you can take what you learned from that and put that into an ontology, or you can use the automatic ontology builders that we've talked about, right? The entity extraction engines. Okay, um, and we found uh, some of these uh, some of these uh, out of the box ontologies to be very useful and very very powerful. Another thing you can do is you've got legacy data in the relational model. So a lot of that should be translated into the graph database model. So that's what this is. You can take any relational database, output it into a delimited file, and then a lot of these knowledge entity relation extraction tools will then convert them into a graph database and into a knowledge graph. Okay? So that's the world of the knowledge graph is better because in the world of the knowledge graph and graph database, you start with the query instead of building the table as you do in, in the relational model. And you don't have to do all these joins that come with doing searches in the relational world. Here, you can very quickly navigate, even if, if an item is 100 hops, the thing you're looking for is 100 hops away. It is much easier to, to do that, but you start by building the query and then that knowledge graph and that graph database uh, emerges from that, okay? So that was our third attempt. So we, we really dove into the notion of ontology with that and, and let's say with the flavor of open source. See, just, to, just for fun to see you know, what we could do with, with that, uh, those constraints. And so um, we did the same. Oh, and the other thing we added, which we learned from the relational database world is to build a data model. Because the first two passes, we didn't really build a data model, right? What's being talked about, what are the classes, what are the entities? Okay? We built the data model first, okay? And then, as I mentioned, we mapped it to the Sumo ontology, okay? Then linked that to the documents, built our graph database, and linked it to the knowledge graph. So in other words, the, 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 the entity extraction was by Watson. The link to the knowledge, which then built a graph database, input it into Neo4j, and then NeoViz displayed it as a knowledge graph. Okay, all right, and out come our inputs, or our outputs rather, and see what we get. Um, and likewise, you you go back and you you have that learning cycle again here, right? This is a learning cycle. All right, so how did that work out in terms of performance? All right, um, here's where, we, oh, oh, the outputs, that's right. So the outputs we produced were that data model, which then helped us define the nodes and relationships, a la RDF, right, and the ontology. Then we, uh, ah, and so the, this uh, middle pane here, the, where it says knowledge base, that's our WordPress plugin, our Echo knowledge base plugin for WordPress. So we are able to arrange all the documents in a, a knowledge base, right? And you could pop up, you could go in there and search and pop up articles, right? Just like any old wiki, okay? But here's the difference. We took that wiki-like knowledge base and with Watson doing the entity relationship extraction, entity association extraction, right? Built our knowledge graph. So now we've got, what we ended up here was a link, and again, you're, uh, some of the vendors in there do this already, for, right, if, if you're willing to, to foot the, foot the, the bill, <laughs> okay, they can do this. Uh, our message here is fine if, if you're at the enterprise level and, and definitely recommend going there because their software is continually updated, but there's no excuse. And if you wanted to learn, get deeper insights into how this stuff works, these off the, off the or, um, open source tools are a good way to do that, okay? So there's our knowledge graph. Um, and 
built with neoviz.js, JavaScript library. Uh, and you see on the left there, we can, we can incorporate helps and that sort of thing. Um, so you, you hover over a node and you get all kinds of information about that node. You click on it, you can go back to that content right in that knowledge base. So we've we're got a nice seamless path between the knowledge graph and the, the content itself. You'll also organized like a traditional knowledge base or traditional content management system. Okay, so we've, we've combined content management with knowledge graphs and, 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 and graph databases. So what was our score? Again, this is subjective evaluation. We really did, you know, improved our, our input uh, because there was a, now it took time, all right? So, you know, if you're, if you're concerned about time, remember the first pass took, a, took the computers a lot of time, right? And then we had to go back and look at it. This, by the time we got to this third pass, the humans were spending an awful lot of time, and it did. It took a lot of time to build that data model and refine it and link it to the SUMO upper, uh, upper merged ontology. So it was human time, not so much processing time. So in terms of the processing time, boom, it was great, because we did all, again, we did a lot of the computer's work for it. But again, the work we were doing was intuitive, thought, human work, okay? Um, so same way, that helped with the speed. Um, helped better with the variety, because that, by, ref by thinking, just the very fact that we had to do a lot of thinking to build that data model about what distinguished one type of object from another. Should they be the same or should they be separate? That thought process took a lot of time, but again, it allowed us to handle the V, the variety part, right, of the five Vs much better. So semant better, we got better semantic understanding. And from that, we're able to then update you know, our own ontology. Uh, so now veracity, again, more human participation. We're still pretty good on veracity and, and, and value. So uh, overall, it was improved problem definition to more systemic problem solutions, right? We were able to tell part of our, of our data models were what, what types of discourse represent problem descriptions and problem definitions versus solutions, and then so we can better match those problems and, and solutions. That's what I'm gonna show you, which is where we, where we ended up going. So there we go, we're ramped up to about 30, 20 out of 30. So here's the case example we did. We had to say, okay, let's, let's try this out with a real case, and we looked far and wide, and um, right around that time, the Boeing 737 incident happened, you know, two planes crashed, and um, there was a lot of investigation, and Boeing then released their internal emails to the U.S. Congress. So we said, ah, data, it real, real in, it, emails. Because it was hard getting people in, in projects and organizations to release their emails. So here's the use case, all right? Most projects, right, especially for large organizations and large complex projects, have this hierarchy, right? All this stuff is going down at the working level, and, but it gets filtered up to senior executive management who has some kind of traffic light system. Is it red, yellow, green? What's the status? And I know from having worked down in those trenches on, in one case, a $6 billion project, um, a lot of the problems we were identifying at, down in the trenches, systems engineering type problems, were actually getting filtered out and not adequately being reported to upper management. So we we're wondering, maybe this is, this, maybe this is what was happening at Boeing. Um, okay, so anyway, Traditional project management, large complex projects especially, tend to be re rear view mirror or oriented. And if there is an alert, that red light goes off at the executive level, you're six months or more into the problem, right? Um, so as the, comp as the organization and project gets more complex, chances for errors increase, as, as you well know, okay? So what else goes into a project? You have, uh, you have a wide variety, and this, is, this constitutes our document corpus, right? So you've got the different phases of the project, and every phase of a project from initiation all the way to, to project retirement um, has its own uh, series of activities and documents. Then there are these siloed, act that goes itself, that's the time, the top one is the timeline, Middle, the, the second row there are the siloed activities. And one thing we did find, uh, not only in this case, but in, in many other cases, things like systems engineering and project management don't talk to each other or HR is totally out of the loop because they're not providing the proper skills match to, 
to support the systems engineering, the project management, right? So all of these are, are our traditional silos. Can you see where this, at least graph databases and knowledge graphs can begin to connect those dots in ways that aren't apparent and definitely haven't been connected in the past, okay? Um, so that, and then we've got to throw in our standards, specifications, all of those documents sitting on shelves or sitting in files somewhere, right? And then all of our historical data, including the lessons learned we had. And um, by the way, we had, a, we had a pretty rich collection of lessons learned data. Uh, one of our participants w led a study of 17 failed projects in DOD and NASA, and he brought all of that documentation to us, so we were able to, to you know, dump that into our, into our bucket. All right, so here we go. Um, and even that untapped Tassano. So there's, there, there's the whole universe of what we're trying to get our arms around. Is it any, un, is, is, shouldn't be any surprise then why there are gaps, there are disconnects, right? That errors and problems occur. Okay, so um, we did our thing, right? Same, same idea here, which is shown before. We crunched through, generated the, the output, um, sent, used sentiment, right? So here's what we came up with. Um, we, we, we did two things. We took the Boeing emails that were released to the public and we ingested those. And then we ingested all of those documents, standards, lessons learned from NASA, which turned out to be the, the key. And then here's a, there's a whole spectrum. On the left, we have the most, the highest salience rated ones. But we found out that um, some of the more interesting findings were on the weak signals, low salience, okay? They, they were not really up uh, in front. They were what we called weak signals. They're kind of lost in the noise, but this, these tools can help us extract it. So let's say there's countless managers. So that was just one, okay? It's rated yellow. So you talked about uh, very low salience, but uh, hey, let's just see what that's all about. We, we, we did a bunch of them, but okay, so what's here? So we can go and read what's being talked about, and people are fed up with all the comp countless, man countless managers, and this is the Boeing 737 MAX project. By the way, we're not Monday morning quarterbacking Boeing or anything, right? They, they were open enough to release this stuff. This is an example of how you can monitor the discourse at the project level, okay, and then say, all right, that's interesting. How about if I go, and you see the sliding, the, the little slider there in the upper right uh, corner of the, of the digital, of the knowledge graph. Let's go out three. You know, you can go out three, four, five, six, seven. Let's slide out three. And we found a match between the complaining about the countless managers, that discourse matched up with NASA's lessons learned about forming IPT leads, okay, uh, in handling risk. So then that insight said, okay, let's look at risk. NASA was dealing with risk. Let's see what that's like. And risk, as you see, came out from the Boeing transcript, uh, came out, look at mood, minus three, right? High salience, 70, but a minus three. So let's see, what's that? Um, so again, NASA talked about risk a certain way, okay? So we were able to gain insights into that. So here, let's, let's just look at this, at our digital hairball, and, uh, and then say, okay, Aries, NASA, had some good insights about risk that matched to the situation in the Boeing 737. So there's that. Um, NASA treated risk with the highest sale, you know, the salience rating went from 10 to 100. NASA, in all of their documents, risk was rated very high, but you see it's green, okay, positive, right? They, NASA themselves, the organization, they, they thought very highly of themselves as well as safety. So we compared Boeing, okay? Boeing thought very highly of themselves, all right, great. They viewed risk negatively, and guess what? Safety never appeared in all of the documentation of the Boeing 737. Safety was not there. You say, what happened? Wow. So this is an example of using this type of analysis and these types of tools to discover what's missing can be often more important than what you find. Yes, it's what you, what you, what you, what you don't see. All right, so some quick lessons learned for that. Um, that, that, was, that was a real eye-opener, especially the, the safety part, and that told us, you know, th these tools are very powerful. Um, so it's hard to build this stuff. You saw it, that, that third pass especially took a lot of work and a lot of, a lot of care and feeding. Um, and, 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 
but you can always keep adding the machine. So it's a learning system, right? A perfect example of a learning system. But human sense making must always be there. Okay, that is the, you know, probably our biggest lessons learned. Um, okay, so we're just saying make use of these open source ontologies. They help make this, the problem of semantics easier to work with. You have to do the front end work, but once you've done it, um, you're able to get better search and navigation results. Bend that, that, uh, that precision recall graph, okay? So our final word is no excuses at all, right? Um, don't let your valuable knowledge get buried and lost, right? Organize and link your content to a knowledge graph and make it accessible, right? So from content database to the graph database and then using the knowledge graph to link the two so you can go back and forth. This gives you the reading where you can read, uh, but you get to see the insights as to how uh, every, every topic being talked about here in the content is related to all of the other topics. And you can query that, of course, using uh, uh, Neo4j's query language. Okay, I think that's it, yeah. Okay, so I hope uh, that, that shares some lessons with you, uh, gave you some insights. Any thoughts or questions? Okay, well, that takes, I think that takes us right up to the end, right? Okay, so thank you very much.